All right, special edition of the Ohio Cash Podcast tonight brought to you by OAC Defense Soap and our partners at Barbarian Apparel. We have tonight's guest, lifelong official. Well, I don't know lifelong, but over 40, going on 50 years, Toby Dunlap. Toby, welcome to the Ohio Cash Podcast. How are you doing tonight, Toby? Well, first of all, thank you, Zeb, for having me. I, I'm doing I'm doing well, and I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, conversing with you. So you are our head rules interpreter for the state of Ohio OHSAA, Ohio High School Athletic Association. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. My official title is Director of Officiating Development for Wrestling. Okay. And your background in wrestling, you were on the whistle. How many years were you on the whistle actually on the mat calling uh, matches? Uh, 33. So 33 years on the mat as an official. How many Ohio High School Athletic Association, OHSAA, Division One, Two, Three state tournaments did you call? 19. 19. Individual. And uh, I think uh, back when the Coaches Association uh, sponsored the uh, the duels, uh, I was involved in uh, always doing the Division I uh, Coaches Association duels. Okay. And that you've been off the mat for roughly 10, 11 years, correct? Correct. And the role changed greatly for you, but it's almost like it feels like you took on a greater role as far as impact and, um, you know, trying to bring young new officials in. What does the new role for you entail as far as rules, interpreter, education, and observer? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's very um, intense. Um, uh, you know, you have to be on top of your game. You have to know the rules. Uh, you have to uh, be able to uh, get along with people. Um, you, you got to wear a lot of different hats and, uh, uh, you know, you're, com you're always juggling, uh, juggling, uh, the various uh, roles. Uh, not only am I the, uh, the DOD, uh, that's the short uh, acronym for director of officiating uh, development. I also uh, work for the uh, Northeast district board as the sport coordinator for wrestling. And basically what I do for them, I'm sort of the liaison between the district board and the sectional district tournament managers in the Northeast District. So, yeah, I, uh, I have a lot of roles, a lot of hats to wear. I had Elliot Spence on. He did. The, he was the first in this series. He's one of the great um, young officials in Ohio, in my opinion. Um, one of my favorites. Yeah, too, too, very thorough. Uh, has gives you his point of view, how the rules are applicable, um, how he felt control went, what he saw. I really appreciate that about Elliot. Not condescending, not rude. I really like that about him. And um, I, in talking to him, I didn't know a lot of his background in the sport. Elliot was an NCAA finalist. Yes. Uh, and a state placer for uh, an NCAA finalist for Mount St. Joe. And then a, a state placer for Cincinnati Elder. So he, he never really left Cincinnati a whole lot. Um, he did do some coaching over in PA and did some, some different things when he got an MBA. But good guy, great, great guy overall. Not a lot of your officials have that high level of a background in the sport of wrestling, like like an like an Elliot Spence, right? You do right. have, I mean, but what is your background in the sport of wrestling? Did you wrestle in high school? Did you wrestle in college? Do you just love the sport? Why wrestling? Why the sport of wrestling? And how did you get involved? Well, uh, I, I wrestled in high school for a very small school up on the lake called Fairport Harbor, and back in that day, uh, it was. We had uh, single A, double A, and triple A, which is uh, synonymous with division one, two, and three. Uh, back when I wrestled, uh, uh, single A, which were the smallest schools, and double A, which is medium-sized schools, we had the same state tournament. We were sort of combined. So there was single A, double A, and then there was the triple A tournament. So uh, things were a little different back then. Uh, my background, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, when I wrestled, uh, you know, they'd throw in the football coach and uh, the football coach would be our, our head wrestling coach. And uh, unfortunately, uh, for my first three years uh, of, uh, of wrestling, uh, I had three different uh, coaches who really didn't know one thing about wrestling. Uh, good athlete I was, uh, but unfortunately did not, did not have the uh, uh, coaching for the technique. Uh, I did qualify for uh, districts uh, for three years. Uh, uh, sophomore, uh, uh, junior, and senior. But uh, at that time, if you lost uh, your your semifinal match, you, you were done. Uh, and, um, you know, only uh, 
uh, uh, the, the first and second place uh, wrestler uh, would would advance to the uh, to the uh, state tournament. So that was when two in the region, and you guys only had eight in your division, right? That's correct. Only eight at the state tournament. Man, I, I go back and I look at some of that old the the, the Mark Osgood book. And oh yeah. yeah, wild to look at. First thing, uh, I got educated last week by Rich Frimmel. Pat Milkovich won one state title. <laughs> Pat Milkovich won one state title in Ohio. One of the all-time greats ever out of Ohio won one state title. I I had to, I was texting Tom Milkovich. I was like, hey man, did your brother only win one state title? And then I uh I was looking for the 1973 state tournament, I want to say, and I couldn't find him. And I'm like, man, he only was only he was like fifth, third, and he was a champ. It was only one three. You could wrestle three years. Were you? Could you wrestle three years? Were you just sophomore, junior, senior? Or could no, the, uh, wrestle four years. Because a freshman could wrestle when you were. Yes. So Pat Milkovich could only wrestle three years. And and I guess it that depended on the school system. Uh, you know, a lot of school systems only would you know their their freshmen were with the junior high. That's and, right. Manor, Manor in the last till the last ten years ago, yeah. 10, 12 years ago, Manor had their eighth graders or their ninth graders. At the middle schools. Right. And, you know, the seventh and eighth graders would have their team and the ninth graders would have uh, a separate team. And uh, then uh, your sophomore year, you went up to the high school level. That's crazy. So you've been around Lake County your whole life. Well, not necessarily. I, I came uh, to the area I was about in sixth grade. Okay. Where did you guys come from? Where did you guys move from? Uh, I moved from, uh, well, my, my father worked for the U.S. government, so I lived all over the world. So, so you were like a, like what, what, what was his, what, who was he working with? Uh, well, we lived in uh, Saudi Arabia. He worked for Aramco oil company. Uh, I, lived I didn't in know Saudi this. Arabia. Yeah. For four years. And uh, uh, from there we went to the South Pacific, uh, uh, the Marshall Islands and the Caroline Islands. Uh, so I lived there for four years. You and, lived in the Marshall Islands? Yes, absolutely. Is it sweet and tropical and as awesome paradise as you think it is? Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. I've been to Hawaii for a flow wrestling thing that I did for, like, almost, like, nine days. It was it was more than the hype, just so you know. I was yeah. like, this is unbelievable. Marshall Islands has got to be similar, right? Oh, I, I mean, uh, I don't know what it is now, but back in the day, it was... Uh, you know, it was uncommercialized. Um, yeah. So everything was pristine. Um, uh, not like uh, you see, well, some parts of Hawaii now are very commercialized. Yeah. For example, Waikiki Beach. O you know, Oahu, but, Waikiki Beach, we were yeah. there. It's it's wild. Like Waikiki or uh, Oahu is just, um, what do you call it? Honolulu mm -hmm. is exploded. It, yeah. It's massive. How are you able to stay in Northeast Ohio? In Lake County, after living in the Marshall Islands for four years, you got it. To, how are you able to do it? Well, you know, my uh, my my father was a secondary teacher, and uh, the reason we came back to the states is, uh, you know, I was getting near high school age, uh, you know, junior high, high school age, and he he said, you know, it's time to come back uh, to the states, uh, you know, for your education, and uh, he settled down in Fairport Harbor as a teacher, and that's how I ended up there. That is wild. So your dad. Was a teacher that traveled all over the world? Yes. That's what your dad did. And he probably made a bunch of money because he was traveling, educating kids who were working for oil companies, whatever, U.S. government, kids on bases, whatever it was. What was the Marshall Islands? Was it a base? What was that? Well, Marshall Islands at that point was a trust territory of uh, the United Nations. And um, uh, basically... Uh, the trust was run by the by the U.S. government, Department of Interior, and they set up the uh, and would run the educational system there. And your dad just was rode the wave, rode the wave, wave. went all yeah. over the world. Yeah, that's exactly. amazing. But and you know, he was, of, well, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, um, my father was a World War II vet. He was in the Navy, and uh, he was part of the island hopping as they were moving toward uh, Japan, and. Uh, uh, after the service, uh, he was um, stationed in Japan as part of the occupation. And uh, when he retired from the service, he, he stayed on and, and worked for uh, General MacArthur, who set up the 
you know, the governmental system, the constitution, the educational system in Japan. And, um, you know, my father was part of that. And where, okay, where'd your dad meet your mom? In Japan. So that's your dad. Dude, this is this story gets the more you're telling this is wild, dude. So my grandfather, Ferd, Ferd Miller, was an island hopper as well. He was at Guam in the Philippines. My grandfather was involved in every major amphibious land invasion in Europe, North Africa, Sicily, Italy, uh, D Day, and then. They sent him home for leave for a month, took a train from Norfolk to Toledo, did leave for a couple of weeks, and then went, got shipped out, trained out from Great Lakes in Chicago to San Diego, went on convoy, Guam and the Philippines. Wow. And as I said, my father was, uh, uh, you know, obviously on a ship, and uh, they would cart around the Marines uh, who did the actual um you know, uh, landings on the islands. That's what my grandfather drove the LTV. He drove the LTV, the, the landing craft. Yeah, wow. The gunner's made on an, uh, an LTV. Mm -hmm. And I have all the, uh, so my son's named after him, Ferdinand, and I got a brother, Ferdinand. So, yeah, um, but I have all this commendations and everything. It's pretty cool. I got to, I'm actually going to put them up here in the studio. Wow. Another cool thing. So where were you actually born? In Japan. So you're, Oh my goodness. This is this just it just keeps Toby, it keeps getting <laughs> so are you a dual citizen? Uh no, I had that option uh when I turned uh, 21, but uh I decided just to declare my US citizenship. That is why okay. So were you born on a base? Yes. So you technically could be president of the United States. I you know, I'm not sure how that works. I think uh, you can. You're, that's American soil. You, If you're born on a base, you're able, I, I believe that's actually. Never had that aspiration, so I never looked into it. <laughs> but I, no, I, I, I think, because like, if you're not, that's like one of the big disqualifiers. Right. If you're not born in the U.S., right? You cannot be. For example, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was born in Austria, governor of California. Yeah. Could, run for could the not president. be the president, though. Yeah, that's wild. Wow. I didn't, uh, where were you born? What What, what city? uh masala Ace air force base okay that's that's crazy yeah that that blows my mind i had no idea and then where's mom from in japan uh she's from the southern island of kyushu so she's from a sweet place yeah yeah is it like fishing was it like a big fishing place uh back then she was sort of inland so it was mountainous uh, gotcha yeah any family over there still for you uh, I'm sure I still have, uh, cousins, uh, but, uh, I've only been back on, on business and my schedule was so compressed. I really didn't have a chance to, uh, you know, make, make, reach out and make contact. How many times have you been back on business just once? Uh, no, oh, maybe five, six times. Oh, wow. You've been there that many times. That's wild, man. That, that I had no idea that that was your background with. I didn't know that you had a Jap your mom's Japanese. I had no clue. I had no idea. And dad, where's your dad originally from? Uh, Pittsburgh. I'm not going to hold that against him. And his uh, his parents came over from Scotland. Wow. My grandfather and grandfather. You, you got about all the boxes checked. You know that? <laughs> Pretty amazing. Uh, okay. So the sport of wrestling, who put you in? How did you get, where do you bridge the gap? Where do you get involved? Is it, what is the name? What is the name of uh, Fairport Harbor? Is it like Warren? It's not Warren G. Harding or is it Taft? What is the it's, name? Uh, it's uh, Harding, Warren G. Harding High School. It's Warren, I was right. It was yeah. Warren G. Harding, Fairport Harbor. Absolutely. Now they're building a new school. So I don't know if they're going to keep the uh, name Harding High or uh, maybe they're going to go to something different. I don't know. So how do you, be, you're a skipper. You're a Fairport Harbor skipper. How does the sport of wrestling... You're not a big guy. I know that. You're not a huge guy. Is that what draws you to the sport? Yes. Uh, you know, it, it was, you know, even though I played football, uh, oh uh, you know, obviously for a smaller school, but uh, uh, there was always something about wrestling, uh, the, the challenge. And plus, you know, you're always competing against somebody relatively your own size. And, you know, that was a, a, a drew me in as well. 
Um, we had a, a, a gym teacher uh, who um, started a uh, intramural program. And uh, I think I was in uh, sixth grade when I uh, started uh, competing in this intramural program. And it, it just uh, went on from there. So you get out of the sport, you lose in heartbreaking fashion, you don't qualify for the state tournament. You go out into life. What do you do after Fairport Harbor? Do you go to college? What, what did you do? Yeah. Uh, I went to college. I did not wrestle in college. Uh, I sort of hit the books. Uh, so uh, I was a uh, organic chemistry major. So uh, I really didn't fathom competing in college. Uh, uh, plus, you know, the background that I had, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't a, a stud, I was a good wrestler, but not a stud wrestler. So, uh, you know, it just really didn't appeal to me. In fact, uh, I was recruited not in wrestling to, uh, to wrestle, but uh, in, in track and field. So <laughs> I was a sprinter. So uh, that was probably my, uh, you know, my main sport was uh, track. So a little athleticism in the Dunlap family, I'd say. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you've branched out since then, so there's even more athleticism in the family now. So when I look at it, how do you come back to, like, you're in college? Where'd you go to college? I went to uh, Case Western, and then uh, I, I finished up at uh, Lake Erie because uh, my father took ill, and I, I had to come back and, you know, stay at home. So I put a list of schools on the board today. You know, I took the, the eight Ivies, the academies, Stanford. And then I put the schools that compete in Division Three, like MIT, Carnegie Mellon, NYU, University of Chicago. You obviously know that Case Western is up there when we talk about the oh, Ivies, right? Absolutely. Obviously, then you got the four academies, the Coast Guard Academy, Navy, Army, Army West Point, and then Air Force. And then you guys are in that elite, you know, Case is in that elite group of the top 20 schools, right? I mean, I don't think it's up for debate, right? They're, it's oh, pretty it's a, incredible. Yeah, it's it's a very uh, very renowned and uh, uh, educational institution. It's D three. Did it ever cross your mind when you're in the middle of hitting the books? Or you're like, maybe I should wrestle. Did it ever cross your mind? Yes, it did. Uh, you know, regardless, uh, once it's in your blood, you know this, uh, Zeb. It, it it's it'll be with you for the rest of your life. It's like the mob. They keep, they just keep bringing you back in. <laughs> Once you're in it, man, you're just like, you, you know, you're like, you just said, we, we know we're saying it to each other, but maybe people listening are like, well, no, I don't know. Yeah. Once you're entrenched in it, you know, and then you had a kid who wrestled, right? Like at what level do you get back into officiating then? You graduate from Lake Erie college, you get a, a job. When do you get married? When do you start a family? When do you get back into officiating? It probably all happened at the same time, uh, you know, job, marriage, and uh, uh, a little later having kids. But, uh, uh, you know, it, I started officiating football first. Really? I, I got my license in football. And uh, uh, then uh, maybe a year or two later, I, 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 I liked the uh, camaraderie on, on the football field with the crew. And uh, then I said, you know, I, I really like officiating. I enjoy it. And I said, well, you know, I do have some background in wrestling and uh, that would be um, something to take up. So I, I called one of the old time officials that I remember from high school. He, uh, Dick Knuth, he uh, uh, coached at Harvey and he also officiated uh, one of the better officials in the area at the time. And uh, he sort of, uh, you know, showed me the ropes, uh, what I needed to do, uh, who I needed to contact. And uh, back then it was uh, a, a simpler time and uh, it was rel relatively easy to do. When did you rough your first match from your first match to your first state tournament? How long did that take to become a young official first starting out first season first state tournament? What was the, the time period there? It took me 10 years, 10 years. Wow. 10 years. And at that time, um, you know, you had a group of great, experienced and by experience i put that in quotes uh i, I don't want to refer to age but uh, a great group of uh, experienced officials that uh, you know the sandy cagios the the denny palmers um, the don ferris's uh, uh uh don schonauer jim schonauer um uh, 
um, it was um, really difficult to break in. Um, now, for the first five years, I really didn't really, I, I did not get into it in a serious way. You know, I'd do junior high, I'd do freshman, I'd never had the inkling to do, to do varsity. And uh, after that fifth year, it just kicked in. And uh, I decided, well, you know, this, you, know, you have to set goals for yourself. And uh, when you enter, when you become official, you, you really have to set a goal for yourself. What do you want to get out of it? Do you just want to do junior high? Do you want to focus on youth? Uh, are you just satisfied doing high school and not doing tournaments and advancing? Um, or uh, do you, you know, do you want to go the full, uh, you know, the full Monte, so to speak, uh, and uh, uh, qualify for a state tournament assignment? So at, at the beginning, you have to set your goals. It, it's wild for me to look at how we're in a, such a shortage at this point. I, I, I think I set off camp crisis mode. Oh, absolutely. And I just don't think people realize how much of a crisis, and listen, it's not just wrestling. It is everything across the board. Zeb, you hit the nail on the head. Now, you might not know this, but statistically, uh, you know, all sports in terms of uh, officiating, uh, the number of officials have gone way down. Uh, for example, I think in the last 10 year period, uh, there was maybe a 33, 35% dis decrease in football officials. Whereas in wrestling, uh, I, I think it's more like in the, uh, the mid teens in terms of the percentages of uh, uh, in, the, in the last 10 years of officials who've gone out uh, of the sport. So in a way we've been very fortunate, but we need more officials. Uh, the sport is growing, particularly with our young ladies. Uh, you know, they've, uh, yeah. they have really hit the mat with a storm. I mean, they're just uh, hook, line and sinker. They're really getting into it. It's, it's how it has exploded and how they're going to end up having to add a division. It's all one division right now with the girls, right? right. It was, it's, a, uh, it's wild to see, man. And, and uh, the level of wrestling since 2004 being added. Um, in the Olympic program, women's freestyle. Uh, yeah, I you never could have told me it would be where it is. It would be on the floor of the Schottenstein. We'd have the high level competitors that we do have in Ohio. We have it always. We always have, obviously, like really high level. But our 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 girls, we have girls that win Fargo. We've got it's pretty high level to see that level and to see like what it's become and what it's evolved to it's wild, man. It's wild. It, it's just, yeah. Like you're saying, like, I, yeah, it, it, it's the real deal. Well, absolutely. And in, in fact, uh, you know, the, the first uh, couple of uh, state uh, uh, tournament qualifying uh, to, to qualify, you know, we had the pre-regional and the regional concept for the girls. And uh, basically when you have a, a regional, it's, it's run by the OHSAA. Well, the, uh, the sport has grown. So, for the girls that, uh, for example, this year, uh, the qualifying tournaments are being pushed down to the district level. So they're going to have three they're going to have sectionals, districts, and state. Wow. So they're, they, this will be the first year for it. The first two years, it was regional state, right? Well, it was a pre-regional state. I think the first year might've been a regional. And last okay. year, last couple of years, I think was the first years that we had a a pre-regional, which is synonymous with a sectional. Gotcha. But um, uh, uh, now each of the four districts, uh, we're, we're actually five districts in Ohio for wrestling, but for girls, I think it'll be be the four. Uh, they will have a, um, a regional, or I'm sorry, a, a sectional and a, a district uh, to qualify to the state tournament. Gotcha. So they're they're going on par with the, the boys. Yes. Gotcha. Which, I mean, you can see that coming. There, oh, what, what's the division going to be added, do you think? The divisions to the girls? Well, I, I think this year is a wait and see year. We're going to see how many uh, uh, competitors we have. Uh, you know, obviously, to add another division, uh, you, you have to have the, uh, the critical mass to do that. Yeah. Um, and I, I predict within the next uh, few years, uh, we'll be there for another division. 
Wow. That's, if it keeps on growing. That's incredible. It's in, when the interest is there and, you know, when you have. Well, the interest is, is really there. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I, so, so Toby, what do you think we need to do? What do I need to do as a media guy? I mean, we already know what you're doing, right? Your job is to educate and to observe. What do we need to do? Parents, coaches, whatever it may be, administrators, what do we got to do to really get out of crisis mode and replenish the ranks in Ohio officials at all levels? Recruit, recruit, recruit. Um, we've had some initiatives where we're going to the high schools. We're going into the, uh, the colleges. Um, uh, some high schools uh, who have uh, phys ed teachers as officials, uh, uh, they uh, have uh, uh, got uh, clearance from the school from their school boards to offer a credit class uh, in officiating, uh, and uh, a lot of high schools have started uh, uh, officiating classes uh, for for high schoolers. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, we word of mouth uh, parents. Uh, uh, grandparents, uh, whatever it takes, uh, we'll, we'll pull from, you know, uh, whatever we need to, to, to fill those ranks. Now, uh, the more that we have, uh, and because of the attrition rate, uh, the better, uh, because as you and I discussed, uh, uh pre-air that, uh, uh, a lot of officials within the second year are, uh, are, are out of it. Uh, they, they decide that, uh, it's not for them. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it, 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 they get discouraged by uh, maybe they have a bad experience on the mat. Uh, uh, you know, maybe fans don't like what they're doing and, and yell at them. And, uh, uh, you know, you know, fans have the right to be a fan, but, you know, not to chastise uh, and get personal with uh, with officials because uh believe me you, if you have a young official out there and uh somebody's you know down his throat or her throat um it uh, you you think out there you know, what am i doing this for is it worth it and uh, they leave you know it's like so, you, talk, you have a full-time career right you got a full-time career you travel all over the world you know you're, you're doing all these other things you're raising a family and then you're going to go out for this like part-time job you say hobby. Some people may even call it a hobby, right? And you're going to go out there to get verbally abused. Yeah. yeah. What are we doing? What are we doing? Right. And yeah, but exactly. I told you, have I been guilty? Okay. It's an emotional sport, right? This is an emotional sport. You had a kid who's a state placer. You know how emotional it gets at the state wrestling tournament. You know, the state semifinals get heated. The state finals get heated. The placement matches get heated. The quarterfinals, right? It's the biggest stage our kids can be on at the high school level. Right. Um, and I told you, I was going to, I'll tell you, right. And this is not something I'm, I'm not like proud of it, but I remember uh, my nephew was wrestling in the state semifinals and um, I don't know who the officials were, but it was when it was in the, the crappy gymnasium because of COVID. Yeah. And um, uh, he's just, he's killing this kid. I mean, he is just, he is, just mangling this kid he's winning by it's it's uh 10 to 10 to 1 just just taking the kid down abusing you know throwing boots in turning him letting him go once takes him down turns him again you know he's beating the kid really handily right uh 13 to 2 14 to 2 and he takes one backward step and the official hits him for stalling. And I, Toby, I'm not proud of it. And I did it in front of like, I brought in um, one of the best media journalists there is in the sport of wrestling. She's now the, uh, uh, the in stadium uh, talent and announcer for uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Steelers and the Penguins, Hannah Mears. She's standing right next to me and I lose my mind. And I'm like, dude, he's mauling him. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? I mean, I'll, I'll send you the video. I'm not super proud of it, but he's just, he's kicking the tar out of the guy. And I'm like, come on, man, what are you doing? Why would you, you know, and how is that productive? I'm either the official, I'm either making him angry, right? You know, or I, what am I doing my nephew any favors, 
right? I just, I just, I don't know what you, but it's, it's an emotional thing. You know, we get emotional, right? And it's, it's an emotional sport. You're trying to kill each other, right? So yeah, I lost my mind and I'm not proud of it, but thinking back on that and reflecting on it, I'm like, yeah, what, what, what am I doing here? What, what are you doing, man? You, you, and then my wife's like, Hey, that's not going to help him just so you know. And she's right. But a lot of people can't step out of it and reflect on it. Like I'm reflecting. He wins the match. He wins the state championship. He pins the guy in the first period in the state finals. What good did that do? What good did I do, Toby? Well, yeah. Yeah. Wrestling is a unique sport. And as you alluded to, it's a very emotional sport. And particularly if you have a, a wrestling pedigree and uh, you see what goes on out there, uh, it, it, and if you don't like what you see, it, it, it gets to you. Yeah. But it was counterproductive. You know, he's got to wrestle in the state finals because the way it was that day, it was a two-day tournament. And then your semis were the morning, Sunday morning, and then you had the final Sunday afternoon and limited in the high school gym, which sucked, but I mean, that came out in the wash, right? The best guys won and it was, you know, they just, but it wasn't a shot and steam, but we got a state tournament. So I'm not going to complain. Right. But yeah. like, it was yeah. iffy. It was iffy. It, yeah. 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 I, when the uh, state tournament was uh, canceled during that uh, COVID year, uh, yeah. I literally, at, I, I was at the OHSA office and uh, uh, I was literally, I stood behind uh, uh, the wrestling administrator, uh, Tyler Brooks, uh, who was a wrestling administrator at the time, when he sent hit on a uh, uh, blast email that, uh, you know, closed down the state tournament. Uh, oh, unbelievable. Uh, yeah, like I can tell you that the nephew who won that, he won the following year in the high school gym. He would have been right there to win that year too, you know? And it's just like, yeah, that, that's a shame. Who knows, right. Yeah. Who knows? And you know, he's a, he's an NCAA D2 all American. So he's pretty good. Right. He's pretty good. Yes. He's actually right here. He goes to Grand Valley state. He was, he was eighth last year at 197 Wyatt, my nephew Wyatt Miller. But like, how did I help Wyatt Miller by screaming of the official, like a, like a lunatic. Right. Well, maybe it made you feel better. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't because then I was just like, "What? Why would I do?" You know what I mean? Then my wife's like, "Dude, what? You can't do that. It's it's counterproductive." And then the uh, mega superstar of the future, Aaron Andrews, literally Hannah Mears is like, "Oh my God, what's wrong?" She's looking at me like, "This guy's what is?" She? I think she was like, "What? It's, you're never. What is happening?" And that was it because I'm in a media role usually, and it's like when you're in a media role, it's yep, should be yeah level ground you're you're not there to you know you can't cheer on the floor at the ohio state tournament if you're me you can't do that yeah. you pull your credential and kick you out in a heartbeat you know and at this point i did step in the stands at least i you know i was like uh an uncle for you know that match but it's counterproductive is the point and it's gonna run officials out it's not good it's not about me it's about the kids out there wrestling yeah absolutely and the, I think the biggest educational thing I, that I've heard, like people say, when I hear these, you know, when I hear Paul, Paul Basinger, when I hear uh, uh, Ron Nisa, when I hear these guys, you shouldn't even notice the official. You shouldn't know the guy's name. You shouldn't want to go follow the guy out in the parking lot and punch his that, that, That's a mark of a good official. Yeah. When uh, even if the match was uh, heated uh, and the match is over, and you don't remember who the official was. Yeah. That's what all officials strive for. Yeah, and it was I, I was asking Elliot about some crazy stuff that happened at the state tournament last year, and he was just like, people make mistakes. We're humans, right? And as you and I were talking off air, you guys don't, you, Ohio, OHSAA, Iron Man, whatever it is, you don't have the luxury of video review. No. Um I think logistically, uh, number one, it'd uh, be very difficult to do, although they do in the NCAA and they have it down, I think, pretty good. But, uh, you know, at the high school level, I just don't think uh, maybe someday at the state tournament, I heard that uh, uh, maybe they do it already in basketball, but uh, uh, at the high school level, the state tournament. But wrestling, I don't think it'll ever come into uh, vogue, so to speak. So you 
had a son who wrestled and was a state placer. Talk to me about, had you ever had any emotional experiences as dad? Of course. But I knew, given my standing as an official at that time, um, what I would do, even at, even at a dual meet, uh, Jody, my wife, and I would, would walk in and she'd sit down with the uh, uh, moms and dads from the, you know, from the school that my uh, son attended. And uh, I would go up and sit in the top row of the bleachers and try to be incognito, uh, knowing what it's like to be an official and down on that mat when somebody is uh, uh, yelling at you. Um, I was very fortunate uh, when my son qualified for state. Uh, I also, my rotation, I was uh, slated, uh, I was assigned to the state tournament as well. And of course, the OHSA, they don't know that your, 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 your son qualified. And uh, I, I came right out and said, you know, my, my, my son's here. Uh, I'd rather be a dad. I don't want the assignment. And uh, 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 the, the head official, uh, uh, you know, well, at that time it was Vince Matucci. Uh, he said, uh, you know, Toby, uh, uh, we want you down here. And I said, uh, what I will do is, um, oops, sorry, my, my iPad just went out. But uh, I said, what I'll do, uh, I won't do officiate any 112 matches. Uh, I won't uh, officiate, uh, you know, any uh, uh, potential opponents of, uh, of my son. And uh, uh, when he's up, uh, I'm going to go up in the stands. And, uh, you know, that's what I did at the state tournament. And he came back through the concies. He lost his semifinal match. And it just so happened that his placement match for third place came up on my mat. No way. Yeah, I was a, I was the uh, the team captain for that man. He came up on my mat. I go, well, guys, uh, figure it out. Uh, who who is ever up next? Do the match. I, I'm going to go up and stands and sit down. And um, and I didn't even tell him that was my son on the mat. Uh, I don't know if you know Scotty Myers, but uh, he was the official who actually did the match, and uh, he had no clue that it was my son. That's wild. That's crazy. And then afterwards, probably, hey, it was my kid, right? Well, no, I, I I went up to him after his match and, you know, gave him a big hug. And uh, uh, I was very proud. But, uh, uh, you know, did the typical father things. And then I went about my way. I had a job to do. That's why. See, yeah, like managing the emotions is just so, so difficult. And, you you know, when you see something like it's egregious, in your opinion, right, you're like, oh, man, like, luckily, did anything crazy happen or was did he just dominating? Was he fifth, third? What was your kid? What was uh, he, he was third. He was third? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he lost his semi um, to a wrestler from St. Ed's. Oh, my God. Uh, Harris. Yeah. Did Harris but, win the weight or was it Hardy? Or was Hardy it? won uh, that year. Uh, Hardy uh, beat Harris in the finals. In the finals, yes. And Harris beat my son in the semis. This is a good weight, dude. Yeah, it was a real good, pretty good weight. Pretty good weight. Yeah. Uh, I mean – uh, he came out of Maslin Perry, and there there were about, uh, I think, six uh, state-ranked, uh, according to Brakeman, wrestlers, uh, you know, in the, in the top 10 in that district. So for about 15 years, your kid was the highest state placer for Riverside until last year. Yes. <laughs> That's wild. Uh, you know what, Rossboro might have taken no, third. Uh, Rossboro, I think, it took, he might have took a third. He got fourth and third. Yeah. But uh, let's see, you know, Lakia was a place. I don't know. Uh, Lakia was fifth. Was fifth. Yeah. Um, then, you know. Diamond was the, fifth. Greg Hines was sixth. Poth was fifth. But, yeah, they had yeah they had places. But your kid was the highest placer till like, Rossboro. That's pretty good. It's not bad. Uh, when we talk about this, managing – getting more officials involved, right? Obviously you want old wrestlers to do it, but it doesn't always have to be old wrestlers. I know that you guys have a streamlined system. Everything is streamlined on the phone. You get paid, you do the training. It's either on, you can do it on an iPad, you can do it on a phone. Yeah, it's called uh, Dragonfly. It it's a new platform called Dragonfly. Okay. And, um, Dragonflyathletics.com. And that's where you sign up to be official. That's where you take your video courses uh, that's where you uh, receive your assignments. 
and you even get paid through the app. That's what uh, uh, Elliot Spence said. It's basically a one-stop shop for everything. It is. Assigning everything. Assigning everything. Uh, becoming an official, taking the courses. As I said, uh, in your initial sign-up, uh, uh, that uh, uh, when you express interest in becoming an official, it's, it's all done on this uh, Dragonfly app. So this Dragonfly app goes on your iPhone, goes on your whatever phone. Yeah, you just uh, down, download it from the app store. And it's you just create an account and you get rolling. You create an account, get rolling. Absolutely. Pay your dues, uh, the whole works. Education, everything. Education, everything. So are you putting together courses that go on Dragonfly? Do you teach online? No. Like, we, you know? we used to have online trainers uh, who were local officials around the state and they would uh, train. But now this is the first year uh, there are no trainers. Uh, th the courses are canned courses. Uh, I think um, put together under the auspices of the National Federation of High Schools and uh, the, the videos that cover you know all aspects of officiating. Uh, now, the bad thing about it is, you know, you can learn the rules and know the rules for, from the courses, but mechanics and how to apply the rules, uh, Dragonfly doesn't teach that. And that's up to us and our local officials associations. We have 19 uh, associations around the state. So once these uh, uh, trainees uh, graduate from the Dragonfly courses, uh, the trick is, is to get them associated with a local officials association so they could be mentored, so they can learn mechanics. Um, and there's uh, a lot of uh, or, uh, the, the OHSAA uh, provides associations, if you apply for it, uh, with uh, um, a stipend that you could use for training or some associations use to pay um, mentors and uh, the, the mentees a, a nominal fee to go out and do a, uh, a freshman match or, or a uh, junior high match. Uh, the OAC, uh, you know, Jared Opfer and Jude Roth, uh, they uh, sponsor a mentorship program uh, through their organization that uh, I think was uh, rolled out last year that's been great uh, for, uh, for young officials. And what they do is uh, hire a, a mentor, an experienced official, and uh, also hire a, uh, an in inexperienced official and match them up at their events and pay them as they go. Can we get there? Can we get back to having too many officials, having an, enough to do freshman JV, eighth grade? Can we get there? Can we actually do it through OAC, OHSA, Toby Dunlap, all the buddy you mentioned, Dragonfly app? Can, can we get there? I think so, because... Right now, a lot of officials are, are taking the course, okay, and they're getting their license. And as I said before, the trick is, is the next step, uh, the mentorship, the, um, the mechanics, uh, the experience of applying what you learned online to what is actually going on in the mat. Because, you know, you, you can know the rules, but if you don't know how to uh, apply the rules to a certain situation, uh, you're you're lost. It, it's, it does you no good. Uh, but we're 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 sort of getting a lot of uh, officials into the pipeline. Uh, the trick is is to get them through that pipeline and get them ready, mat ready in, in terms of uh, uh, mentoring, uh, me me mechanics work, and uh, application work of the rules on the mat. We have, I think we have a good core right now in Ohio. I think we have good guys with, you know, who have wrestling backgrounds, who don't have wrestling backgrounds. I, I mean, I like the the kind of the mix, but where do we go from here as far as having parents understanding their role, right? Having uncles understand their role. How do we get people to have at least some empathy? Like I knew immediately that I was out of line, right? Uh, you know, but like most people are like, ah, screw that guy, F that guy. How do after that late, you know, that that person, right? What are, how do we get people to understand that the rest that they're under a lot of the time? That's that's always a, a, a difficult uh, issue. Um, you know, the fish on the mat, uh, and, unless uh, a fan is really 
I guess wrecking the progress of the mat as the as the official is officiating. Uh, the official has a choice of having that uh, fan removed, but I think it's up to the uh, the school management, the school administration at that event, to police the uh, the uh, the crowd, the the fans. Uh, but but again, it's it's it, it's tough because you might have one or two administrators in a in a gym packed full of. Uh, uh, parents and grandparents and uh, uh, the worst fans are is grandma in the second row of the stands so, yeah to be honest with you yeah they're getting out they're getting and maybe they don't know the rules and they're just emotional right empathy how about that just just have a, maybe a little empathy right yeah exactly and you know and, and obviously if we do a better job in uh, training our officials uh, to have uh, not have those uh, breakdowns on the mat uh uh, you know, that goes a long way to helping the situation as well. But uh, there's really no excuse. Uh, officials wrong or right to, to jump down his or her throat. Uh, OK, so last year we had some crazy emotional matches at the Ohio High School State Championships. All divisions, the four divisions, the girls and then the three boys. Um we had a uh, a state final that ended in an injury. Um, I don't know if people know the rules there with that one. Um, we had a division three. Um, we had a, a, an injury that occurred, right? A, a head injury, right? And when we go to a head injury or somebody is out, depending on what the call is on the mat, that match is over. That is correct. Um, we, we have a concussion protocol and actually it's, it's state law. If, an official or even a coach observes sign symptoms or behaviors consistent with a concussion, the match is over. Over done. In state law. We're not we're not playing with brain brain injuries. It's we're not messing around. Exactly. So for example, you see the eyes roll back in the head or the um, uh, or the wrestler uh, is, is incoherent, doesn't know where he or she is. Uh, you know, that's a sign or symptom and uh, one of the signs or symptoms and you, you have to call the match. Yeah. Uh, and that's what happened at, I want to say 165 division three, um, a kid was returned to, with, to the mat with force, went unconscious. The call was made a slam with force. And then the guy who actually got knocked out won the state title because the other guy put him down with force. Yes. It's, 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 and that's just that's the facts of the matter yeah and that's uh you know those are the rules yeah i mean no i don't think anybody's debating that one yeah. i don't feel like that one was controversial there are it's, ones that i do think were controversial yeah and, and believe me i i i i know which matches you're you, you're thinking about okay so two matches well actually two same guys wrestle two separate times Okay, we yes. had a guy from Dublin, Scioto, and we had a guy from Sci Scioto, and then we had a guy from Brexville. They wrestled. I, I remember that well. Okay. It went to an overtime, and they let someone make a choice. Yes, they did. Um, that is that correct? Am I, am I, is that correct? No, you're, you're absolutely a right. Right out right. ultimate title. Uh, right. UTB, right? You have a choice of top or bottom. Uh, it's none of this. Right. No neutral. <laughs> no, no neutral. No. And they and, let the individual choose neutral, but if you choose down. neutral, you'd either have to go top and let the other guy out, which gives a point, right? Which effectively ends the match, right? Yes. Wow. How do you, in what you well, can in, in that situation, uh, that would have been called, that should have been called bad time because that rule, I mean, you can't let somebody choose neutral in the, uh, you know, in the ultimate tiebreaker. Uh, and so that would have been bad time. The, the period and all points scored in that period would have been wiped out and they would have been started fresh. Okay. So I don't know if you know this, but I had a nephew that was wrestling in the NCAA quarterfinals. Okay. He literally won the match for Kent State University against Cornell. I remember that, yes. He literally won the match, Okay. They did not give him his one ride time point. Okay. They actually, and I think it actually went in and gave it. Then they overrode the system. No, no, it's 9-9. Nine, nine. He actually won the match 10-9. Of course, he goes in overtime, gets taken down. And it, 
that should be bad time at that point. They should wipe that off, give him his 10-9 win. Yeah, because that shouldn't have happened. Correct. Somebody and in that situation went, in high school, since that entailed a situation that would not have involved additional wrestling because he actually won the match in regulation time, then he would have been brought back and declared the winner without additional wrestling. Yeah. But man, Cornell really wanted to get the match. They really wanted it. Let's get him on the mat. Let's go. He's tired. Let's go. And they got what they wanted. And then Kent State got shooed off the mat and their guy lost. So yeah. it's how it goes. But uh, then the two wrestlers that wrestled in that quarterfinal then meet for third and fourth place. Yes, I watched that match as well. I got Elliot's whole, as much as he kept, kept could articulate to me that he saw um, there were some with force worthy moments. And I believe your head official was uh, Waggison. Brady. Yeah. Brady's a good official. Great official. Yeah, I think I, he loves weights too. He's from uh, I think Gallion. Willard. Gallion. Yeah. Oh, Gallion. Gallion. Yeah. Gallion. Yeah. So anyhow, it gets crazy. They get out of bounds and it was close to a with force call. But the angles they had, they're like, ah, it just looked like wrestling to me. I appreciate that. I yeah. appreciate when it's when it's just wrestling. Yeah, wrestling is wrestling. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, once it hits the point of what we call unnecessary roughness, then you have to uh, penalize accordingly. Or you, you could nip it at the bud and uh, talk to both wrestlers and say, hey, uh, you know, watch the hands. Uh, uh, you know, those heavy hands are really starting uh, to get to the limit. Uh, and, uh, you know. Preventative officiating always uh, uh, should be uh, the primary way to, to handle a situation that is starting to get out of hand. And finally, the elephant in the room, the apparent flying squirrel in Division One at 106 pounds. Um, you were sitting right in the mat. You had an angle. It might not. It was a very different, 180 degree different angle seated from the official who called it. Correct. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I really don't want to comment, uh, you know, on, on an official's call, but, uh, you know, as you know, depending on the angle, you could perceive things very differently. So that that one was called, it was a no call. No he call. He was awarded a two-point takedown and wins the match with one second left, right? When's, that's as time expired. There were so many moving parts to that. And... Um, whether you like the call or not, the guy has a state title at home. We're not going to go call it back. No, they're going to call it back. There's no, no, there's no review, and that's just that's how it goes. <laughs> and if you don't like it, don't wrestle to a situation where you only have a one point lead and you stop wrestling. I True. guess what my comment would be to, um, I mean, I talk to the Perrysburg coaching staff daily, so I mean, I think they know. But you got to give the kid from Highland credit; he wrestled through the positions. He was just trying to win. Right. So it happens. Right. And obviously throwing your colleagues under the bus on a podcast usually isn't too solid of a move. So I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Do I feel in my like and what I saw and what I knew I was I mean, I was like, ah, it's flying squirrel. It's uh, it's uh, illegal. That was what I saw from the angle I had. And I was standing like a standing this far from you, three, four feet from you. And um, it, it was. uh it was, it was something, but now I think it's a learning experience for everybody involved—the officials, the crowd, media, coach, name, name, name it. Everybody learned from that, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, where do we go from here as far as state tournaments? And um, you guys have rotation off rotation years, correct? Yes, yeah, so an official could work uh, two out of three years. So generally, what we try to do is. Uh, assign an official for a two-year stint, particularly a, uh, a first-year official to give him, bring him back that second year so he has, uh, reinforces that uh, experience. So, yeah. you know, over the last, I think Jim Vreeland did some statistics. And over the last um, maybe 10 years or so, we've had over maybe 125 different officials officiate at the state tournament. Wow, that's a lot, dude. I think that's a lot. Do you think that's a lot? Yeah, I, I think it is. But, you know, people really don't 
recognize that, that, you know, how many new people are, are, That's are, good. are coming in. You need and, fresh blood. And we're, we're trying to do that. Uh, that, that that's my, my mandate. If uh, uh, a young official deserves to be there, we brought one in last year. He did a great job, uh, first year official. And uh, uh, we want to bring those uh, officials back and we want to get more like them in. Uh, another area that I want to focus on is getting more female officials into the fold. And uh, I think that's going to start to happen because our, our girls are starting to come through the high school program. And uh, hopefully uh, if they go to college or if they decide not to go to college, uh, we're hoping that they would uh, take up officiating. It appears as though United World, UWW, United World Wrestling, the governing body of the sport of wrestling, um, they do a pretty good job with, with female officials, I think. I mean, they're in the Olympics. I mean, they're at the, you know, USA Wrestling does a pretty good job of it. So I think that that's a pretty good marking point. If you can see, and I understand they're different sports. I get Greco's different. I get freestyle's different. But wrestling's wrestling, right? Right, exactly. Having a female uh, officiate women's matches and men's matches, I think that's something you just have to do. You got to break that down. Absolutely. Uh, and I have no qualms about that. And I... I'm hoping that that will happen. Yeah, I mean, we have to. I mean, I think you got to get there. If, if uh, you know, UWW and if, uh, you know, USA Wrestling's done a, such a great job at it. But, you know, none of the – the NCA doesn't have it. The NCA at no level, I've never seen – I haven't seen it yet, right? Yeah. And they got to be the leaders, in my opinion. I think they got to – I know that, obviously, UWW and USA Wrestling are being leaders in that. But I think we need to see, you know, something from them too, right? I mean, I agree. I'm sure, you would agree with that. Yeah. Uh yeah, man. I just, I think that people don't realize we're in such a crisis mode. I just don't think they get it. I know. Oh, that, no, they don't. They, they just don't. They, they do want to just keep screaming at officials and keep can't run people out of it, man. You can't. We we had some crazy stuff happen this summer in baseball, but it's like, what? I can at least be like what I did in my nephew's semifinal match is counterproductive. When I do in my eight year old kids baseball game, it's not going to change anything. Right. Um, so I just try and yell for the kids a bunch. Right. I just, I want to yell for the kids. I want to yell for uh, and cheer kids on because screaming at the officials does it's, it's counterproductive. It's not good. Agreed. <laughs> I love it, Toby. Uh, what other things have we not covered that you'd like to talk about? Obviously, bringing more women officials on board for, for not just girls wrestling, but to officiate boys. I think that's a good thing. I think Absolutely. we got a starting point there. But is there, is there anything else that uh, talk Dragonfly? We talked about the training, how you can get well, on. No, would you like to talk about some new rule changes for this year? I absolutely, positively would. Well, the uh, the biggest rule change is uh, the one point of contact uh, on the mat uh, inbounds or, you know, boundary lines considered inbounds as well. Uh, you're inbounds. For example, uh, you could be totally out of bounds with a finger touching and I could be totally out of bounds riding you or on your hips and wrestling will continue because one point of contact is on the mat uh inbounds okay you, you, okay i have to correct the rule guy here i feel pretty good about myself right and there's now. no cylinder there's no cylinder there's no cylinder that's not where i was going if it is safe you can do that well that's what i was going to mention next if it, i okay i should have just cut my mouth shut and let you do your thing i wound yeah. you up and didn't let you finish going but and, only and if that's it's safe. That's the uh, the big qualifier. Okay. For example, Toby, you've been Toby, to Toby, Toby, the biggest. We, we got to get this out of the way right now. This is going to get clipped. It's going to be on the internet. I'm letting you know right now. The Walsh Jesuit Ironman is the pinnacle and the top of any. In, it's the tournament of tournaments in the United States of America. You know it. You're at it. You get it. I know you've been to a double digit amount of them. They don't have a big enough mat space to wrestle a lot of those matches the way they need to be wrestled and officiated, and you know it. Exactly. And uh, 
as I said, and you alluded to, uh, safety is the primary concern. Even where the coaches' chairs are, it could interfere with uh, with the wrestlers. And uh, uh, we have to be extra vigilant in, in, in policing that to ensure that uh, uh, if there's a uh, potentially unsafe situation, that match has to be stopped regardless of position. So I'm just going to put this out here. When you have your whole team on the mat or you got a bunch of little kids on the mat and we're worried about some freaks of nature mowing down a bunch of kids on the edge of the mat because they're going to continue wrestling, the wrestling will not continue. The wrestling will be blown dead. You're going to have a bunch of pissed off people. Well, I let them keep wrestling. No, man, safety first. You don't know what you're talking about. And you already know there's going to be like an air fist fight. Oh, oh, madness. You already know that. I could hear it now, it's but uh, again, I just, we, I'm caught. We're 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 in September, Toby. September 2024. I'm calling it right now. You gotta let them wrestle through that position. Absolutely. You have a big enough mat. You're wrestling on a postage stamp. What do you want? Exactly. And uh, again, even uh, I was in a national federation meeting uh, yesterday, and uh, that was emphasized. Uh, safety comes first. It's a primary concern, and you know that's what. Each official, that's their primary concern, is safety. Yeah, it's just like if you return someone with force and they lose consciousness, you are going to lose. The Absolutely. match is over, you will be the loser. Yes. And if you, listen, we love hard wrestling. We like, ah, right, take them, pick them up, put them down hard, right? It's, it's the sport, it's rough and tumble. If you put someone on their head, you are going to lose the match. Yes. It's just that simple. I, I don't know what else to tell people. If, you can be uh, as mad about it as you want. Those are the rules. If you want to lift somebody off the mat, you are responsible for the safe return. When you take a post arm away in midair, when you grab a wrist, you've taken a post arm away. You 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 have created that situation. You were um, potentially dangerous. Yeah, and it's just I just don't think people understand those things well not just potentially dangerous like it it's it's well no. let's assume that uh it's they're in the standing position and in the, in the the arm trap is uh is in there and you see a lift starting uh you're supposed to call it there stop the match yeah which they 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 can blow it dead like you're saying yeah, they can yeah. say potentially dangerous now exactly. uh, uh okay Give me the other. Come on, give me the other big one. The other big uh, rule. Come okay, on. We, we got th a three point takedown now. Three <laughs> point. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, I you know, the NCAA, but uh, it's going to, uh, I, I think, liven things up in the neutral position. Yeah. Let's hope, right? We want that. Um, we have a variety of near fall points now uh, two, three, four. And potentially five if uh, there's bleeding or injury that, that occurs. Oh, yeah, there. yeah. It screams out, screams yeah. out injury on the if they're on their back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Four. Didn't even think about that. We're going to see some of those. There's some five-pointers coming. Nobody's Four. thinking about it. That's why I got the head guy on here. I got the head guy. So, yeah, that's uh, that's another big one. Uh, the other ones are uh, relatively uh, uh, really not that important. Uh, for example, the 10 foot circle in the center of the mat, that's optional now. You really don't have to uh, have a mat with a 10 foot circle. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. And uh, the other one is uh, there is a new rule with respect to a, a new official's timeout, just a signal. Um, so that's. Uh, what is the, what is, okay, what's the new, I don't know. Can you show me the signal? What is it? Oh, well, basically. My, my time. Yeah, exactly. And then they can do that on. Uh, Guy, oh, I don't know, something in my eye. They don't always have to call injury time. If they feel like it's something, that's my time. Right, exactly. Gotcha. Yeah, because a lot of the time the coach is always like, that's injury time. They always just want to run injury time. The official's like, no, I'm the one in charge. It's my time. I, okay. That's okay. Yeah. That's bigger. It's a bigger thing than you think it is, actually. Yeah. It, it, but uh, let's see. There, there might be no, but. Awesome. 
Let me get Toby back on here. Get him back. That yeah, was great. He was talking about uh three point takedown, one point of contact. I'm I'm fired up now. He's got me fired up. Toby, you got me fired up. We'll get him back in here. We'll get him back uh joined up and we'll finish this up. I'm I'm fired up now. Toby's got me fired up about rules. Fired got me all fired up about rules. We'll bring him back in and uh talk about it. You know what? Let's talk about some things we got in the background here. Folks. Just so you know, I'll be selling it on eBay for anybody who wants it. Um, we're gonna put it up here. We're gonna get it. We're gonna get it going. Actually, I should send him a screenshot of that real quick. There's that one. That one's a pretty good one. We got it. Oh, we got a Ferdinand from last year. We'll we'll, we'll do this one in the meantime. Got Ferdinand here. There's my guy. There's my guy, the Kenston Bomber. Ferdy. Let's see. See if we can get Toby back on here and finish up. All right. Get him back on here. We're going to have him back on. Uh, we'll admit him, fix him up, get him going, finish it up. And here we go. All right. Perfect. Gotcha. Okay. Can you hear me? Perfect. All right. Well, you're on my iPhone now. My iPad, uh, I apologize, uh, ran out of uh, ran out of juice. Hey, take your phone from this and do this with it. Perfect. Oh, there we go. Okay. Where we left off. We had the one point of contact, no matter whose point it is. It could be the fingertip of the guy who's getting, who's on his back getting pinned. You can have falls out of bounds, right? Yes. And uh, point of contact falls. Just as long as a pinky toes in bounds, that's considered a uh, contact point. No cylinder. You got it. There has to be a point of contact. Point of contact. On I that. think that, that that needs to be emphasized because college is the cylinder. The cylinder. Someone's hovering over the cylinder. Okay, you could have somebody's, uh, they could be hopping. The left yes. hopping or someone's, like, usually it's like a guy squatting down on his, like, backside is in his hamstrings are hovering over. It's actually pretty wild to watch, man. Because that, what's really hard with that is you don't have an angle for the cylinder. There's no, the angle for the cylinder is the ref standing right on it. Exactly. That's the problem with the cylinder, right? Would you agree with that? I agree with it. I, I really don't think the uh, cylinder uh, concept will ever uh, come down to uh, to the high school level. Yeah, I mean, it, it just, yeah, I, it just, it's too much. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just not a fan of an imaginary cylinder that goes to outer space. How about that? <laughs> when they do that, I'm like, all right, come on, guys. You're, 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 I, I get it. I enjoy, I enjoy the, the amount of, uh, wrestling that it's allowed right but mm -hmm. like it's just too subjective to the ref standing directly on top of it you can't you can't review it it cannot be reviewed yeah so, exactly. but one point of uh of 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 contact is the biggest thing anybody's point of contact anybody's point of contact defensive wrestler's point of contact doesn't matter and then um three-point takedown what do you think to the three-point takedown does for ohio well, you know, Ohio, we uh, tend to work on our feet. Uh, I, and we, the perception is, and maybe it's true, you probably know this, uh, that uh, we really do not teach writing skills. Because well, we, we don't, but we're getting better on the mat. Yeah, we're getting better on the mat, but... Uh, we tend to be uh, takedown artists, and I, I I think this is going to push that narrative a little more um, with, with a three point takedown. Uh, yeah, and it's a kind of wild about Ohio is we've had the Jay Jaggerses and we've had the Joe Heskets of the world. Yeah, can anyone right? And we're we're sharks on top. It's just crazy to think about how how good a lot of our guys, you know, the Logan Stevers who could bar it, right? I mean, those, mm -hmm. those talking about the cream of the crop, right? I mean, but. I think I can tell you from my standpoint, 
If there would have been a three-point takedown, I think my nephew Ian Miller could have won multiple NCAA titles because he was so dynamic on his feet. Beat. Didn't happen, though. So, you know, that's how it goes. But, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda. But I think the three-point takedown helps Ohio, especially at Ironman, right? Yeah. Especially at Ironman. Okay, I know what I had for you. I think Paul Basinger is a top three official that I've ever seen. Absolutely. I That's my opinion of him, okay? But to point this out, he was the official for the Marcus Blaze uh, DeLuca match in the quarterfinals of the Ironman. Do you remember it? Not necessarily, because I was probably floating between the uh, upper gym and the lower gym. Paul called. Paul owns it, too. That's what I love about it. He called a flea in the mat call on a Blaze in the, the sudden victory period. Oh. Yeah. So, but you know what? Blaze. The match is over. But yes, but Blaze made a move out of bounds at that point, right? I think he like went, moved out, and then immediately faced off. So once again, people are human. Some of the most elite officials, right? They they make mistakes, right? Uh, what's the college level? Uh, Matt Sorenchinsky. Matt Sorenchinsky makes mistakes. Matt Sorenchinsky, I think, is top three official in D one oh, wrestling. Absolutely, that's my opinion. Has he made mistakes? Sure. Uh, what's his name? Angel. Angel is unbelievable. Angel catches heat from people, right? Lineage. I think he's a pretty good official. He catches heat. We're human beings, man. We're human beings. I think Angel. Angel and Sornchinsky, though, man. Holy smokes. They are. No, they're top flight. They're they're pretty good. <laughs> they're pretty good. But like when I look at it, there's just so much. Those guys can't miss either. That's the other thing. Those those guys are doing at such a high level, and they have full time jobs on top of it. That's what people don't get. It, yeah, it, Toby. That's what do you, the life of an official. What do you do for a living? What What is your actual job? Uh, I am what is called a patent agent. I um, procure and protect the intellectual property of uh, you know the the company that I work for. Who is your company? Uh, right now, I work for uh, Sangobon. It's a uh, French company. And how many different companies have you been through since you graduated from Lake Erie College? Well, let's see. Four? And was it all you protecting the IP, the intellectual property of the companies? Yeah, well, exactly. That sounds high pressure, man. It it can be because uh, if you draft a uh, patent application and uh, at the end of the application, there's the description of the invention called the claims. If sometimes if you make a mistake of uh, using an and instead of an or, potentially that could cost you millions of dollars. I'm just going to put this out here. I've never, I, I, I'm not doing this in an insulting manner. I don't want your job. <laughs> I don't want your job. Okay? It's, uh, it's fulfilling. It, it, it keeps you on your toes. Uh, you're at the forefront of technology. Um, if you like to advocate for a client, uh, this is the job. Okay. What I've noticed is a lot of those guys, that the D1 guys, are a lot of those, the NCAA D1 guys are in sales. So they have flexible schedules where they're, you know, where they're working with clients and they're traveling, mm -hmm. traveling a lot, right? A lot of those guys are in some type of sales. I think a lineage and both uh, uh, Sorenchinsky, I believe that's what they both do. I believe they're in like sales jobs. Kenton Taglianata, I believe is in the sales job, right? So they're doing jobs where they're, they have flexibility to travel and rough these matches. Do, what, well, not what, only, you know, you know, sales also helps an official, I think, uh, sell a call <laughs> you know in sales you got to be good you got to be able to sell yeah yeah no including, i mean long. including calls that's crazy here's what's wild to me when i look at it i look at these guys they're everybody seems to be in here you can tell me if i'm wrong i notice it seems like a lot of the guys are type a guys they're type a and they're kind of uh they're definitely it, it's rules and they're applying them they're the most strict 
rule followers I think I've ever seen. Like even a higher level than police officers. I uh, I would have to agree. It's crazy to me when I see it. I can like tell you what the guys do. And I'm like, I can tell what this, I can tell just through their personality. I'm like, looking at it, I'm like, wow. And I think Elliot does, Elliot does a similar type job. I don't believe he's sales, but you can tell he's just super squared away. Boom, 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 boom. He knows what he's doing in every minute of his day. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think I'm complimenting these guys. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's the uh, ultimate compliment. Oh, well, um, do you think those guys gravitate to it? To to officiating? Yeah. Why do, why do guys in sales, why do guys who uh, like application of rules, why do they gravitate to, to uh, officiating? Well, it's just an extension of, uh, you know, following and knowing rules. Uh, I, um, that's that, actually, that's a good question, but uh, I, at the same time though, they're, they're officials from all walks of life and all, all different careers, uh, you know, educators, uh, doctors, uh, attorneys, um, they make good officials. I know we had a couple of state highway patrolmen for a long time. They yes. were for a long time. And I know, I don't know if you know anything oh, about the state Matt highway. Majoy. What's that? Matt Majoy. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know if you know anything about how Ohio state highway patrol is. It's like the most militant, like their training. Oh yeah. Is <laughs> it's not like any law enforcement. It's not like the other law enforcement. Unless it's like a SWAT type deal where they're like super, you know, like you make them on wrong move and people are dead, right? Yeah. Their training is super regimented and they, they run it like they run it like it's military training. You know oh. that, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But uh, by the same token, I mean, when these guys, uh, you know, law enforcement officials, uh, um, State Highway Patrolman, when that uniform is off, they're just normal people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just like Navy SEALs are normal people, right? <laughs> A little bit crazier, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know if they're ever normal. I'm not going to lie to you on that one. <laughs> then there's the Delta Force people. They're even crazier. And then you got your Army Ranger, like the Special Force people. They got They got something going on. They got something else going on. Toby, what do you think when we talk about, you know, officiating, we talk about, you know, you've done it 33 years on a whistle, 44 years total involved in the sport. What's the legacy you want to leave behind as an official? Toby was fair and was not afraid to make a mistake and admit to a mistake. Do you have a match that's 20, 30 years old? That you officiated like a good state final, a good semifinal. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll tell you what, what match put my officiating on the map. It was a CIT held at Lake Catholic High School. You know, it tra it travels around the state. Uh, Dominic De Sabato, returning D three state champ, and um, Dan Carcelli, I think he was returning D two state champ. Benedictine. They... Reedy Benedictine. Yes. Um, Carcelli went to Benedictine. And I think, uh, what, De Sabato was Reedy or? Was Reedy, Reedy. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they met in the finals. And uh, this was my, my actually my first big tournament. And somehow uh, the head official assigned me to this, to that match. And uh, it would, it went back and forth, back and forth. And, um, I was on my game for that match. And that really put me and my officiating on the, on, on the map. And from that point on, I was invited to make the CIT circuit, which in officiating circles is, is a pretty big deal uh, because the CIT travels from school, you know, from school to school, from region to region every year. And uh, if you're with the officiating group that gets to officiate, at all of those venues year after year, then you've known, you know, you've perhaps made it. When you make it, first of all, who won the match? 
Uh, Dan Curcelli won by, I, I think, a point. Oh, man. Just tell me. I need to know what were the Sabados doing? What was the crowd like? Oh, it was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, this was the feature match, obviously. Uh, but yeah, but you know, I, you know, when you're on the mat and you're, you, you're focused as an official, you don't hear or you shouldn't hear what's going on around you. Um, you know, that's, that, that's the way it should be. And I really could not tell you, uh, other than what people have told me, what the crowd was like for that match. Yeah, I can only imagine that the Sabados get a little, they get a little, little nutty. If you, if you don't know that, I'm telling you. Uh, a good wrestling family. Yeah, great wrestling family, actually, you know, but yeah, I mean, they get a little nutty sometimes, though. Sometimes it gets away from them, too. Like, it got away from me, and then when my mm -hmm. nephew takes something, I found much. All right, Toby, you got anything else for me? Well, yeah, there's one other rule change that I uh, failed oh. to mention. The, oh. uh, the technical fall. Uh, up until this year, uh, you know, if uh, you gain the technical fall from takedown right to the back, and uh, we gave the offensive wrestler uh, the opportunity to get the fall. So if you came out of uh, criteria, but still were in the same pinning situation, you let it, you let it burn, and you gave the you would give the uh, offensive wrestler a chance again, to put the defensive wrestler on his or her back and work for the fall. Well, this year, for the technical fall, once you come out of criteria, the match is over. You don't let... There's a difference between coming out of criteria and the, the pinning situation ending. So we don't base it on the pinning situation ending anymore. We base it on coming out of criteria. And that's okay. the new rule. Okay, so someone can fireman's carry. They're up 15-2. They can fireman's carry a guy to his back and still pin him, though. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, but there's once continuation. That, right. But once the uh, uh, the wrestler who was fireman's carried to the back uh, comes out of bases out, then the match is over. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't know that that not wasn't the rule. I thought that you, once you got out of credit. Well, for example, uh, I'm leading 15 to two. I, I take you down. I, as you're coming down, I'm able to get a standing cradle on you, bring you down to the mat, uh, get, uh, you know, you're working for the fall. Uh, the bottom guy bases out, but I still have the cradle in. Back in the old day, you would allow that wrestler a chance to bring the the bottom wrestler who's being cradled back over again. It has to be your feet to back. They cannot have the lock, the, the body lock locked up or the half locked up, whatever it is. They got to go to their back. And it, it is, once they come off, it's over. Yes. You can't have the pinning combination locked up. I had the arm bar. I take him down right to an arm bar, but he's not on his back. You don't let him run him over with the arm bar. No, because ah. it, it, it's only in a, a situation taken directly to the back. It's got to go feet to back. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. That's good clarification. Man, I'm glad we got a little overtime in here. You got anything else for me? <laughs> well, that's basically it for the rule changes. Okay. All right. Uh, any grandkids? Are you going to have any grandkids that wrestle? Do you have any son, grandsons? Yes, I have a grandson who's in sixth grade who's been wrestling for about four years off and on. Are you serious? And, yeah. Where's he at? Uh, he's at Lamouth. Okay. Uh, okay. Still, so you have two granddaughters. Two granddaughters that are, uh, uh, they're not wrestlers, but uh, they're uh, good athletes in their own right. Uh, very good athletes, I should say. Okay. So you got a, a sixth grader at Lamouth. Is it Dunlap? Yes. Oh my goodness. So I'll know. I'll know now. Down. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. That's good. And everything else is good. When do you retire? How much longer you got to work? Well, you know, I, I did retire uh, back in 2022. 
And as you know, now I'm, I'm working again. I took a year off. I um, was in retirement. I got a call from a search firm. Do you have said, a concussion? I want to ask you, do you have a concussion right now? What yeah, are you I, I probably do. Well, what anyways, are you doing? Long story, to make a long story short, I uh, was offered the job. Uh, it was an offer I couldn't refuse, and uh, I'm back working. Okay, hold on. You're retired. You could have refused. I could have refused, yes. But it was one of those once-in-a-lifetime offers that, uh, you know, you, you got to jump on. You got grandkids. You got this officiating thing. Yeah. Now you got another full time job. <laughs> Lots of vacation, though. Where do you go when you travel in your job? Do you get to, to, to schedule? No, nah, I can't travel March 8th. That's the state tournament. Can you do you have that control? Yes. If it isn't a, uh, uh, a uh, for example, a, a court hearing or something like that, that, uh, you know, I can't change. Uh, but, uh, all in all, uh, you know, my my employer comes first, um, but I've really had the latitude to, to make my own schedule, uh, you know, for the state tournament, uh, never had a problem. In fact, I've had situations where I was in Europe the day before and flew home, got home and uh, uh, drove down to the state tournament, the, you know, the same day. So uh, wow. <laughs> you're an even, even bigger maniac than I originally thought you were. Well, you know, you have to do what you have to do. Oh man, what what do you? When do you sleep, man? When do you, when do you get to relax and sleep, Toby? <laughs> yeah. Plus, I'm up at four thirty in the morning, uh, so I could go work out before I go to work. Uh, so yeah, I I have a routine. Uh, yeah. Once again, to the type A, to the type A, to the regimen, and that. Listen, I'm not. That's not a knock. Yeah. Right. You're, no, it's it's a personality trait. I I, I think you're what's right. Wrong yeah. with that? And you got guys like me who are just kind of like, ah, hey, whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, guys kind of like whatever. Nothing wrong with kind of like whatever either. Um, well, Toby, man, I'm fired up. I, how is your granddaughter doing in college? She loves it. She's at the University of Kentucky. Uh, she's um, was accepted into their uh, uh, pre dent program. So yeah, I'm not she, shocked. I'm not shocked. She, if she does does well maintaining maintains a grade she'll be guaranteed a a, a spot uh, in uh, dent school so um yeah she's uh so far loving it she's aced her first uh, couple of chemistry quizzes so that's uh chemistry's near and dear to my heart so i'm really proud of her for that and uh, uh my other granddaughter uh is uh, a, a junior at uh, riverside and uh she loves basketball so she's a basketball player you gotta love it, man. That's awesome. That's perfect. I love it. I love to hear it. I love to hear about success. All right, man. Well, I'm. I think we're gonna we're gonna uh, wrap it up. But hey, Dragonfly. Everything people need to go to. If they want to become an official. They can go to ohsa.org. Yes, I would suggest going to ohsa.org. Um, go to the officiating tab. Then there's a drop down menu. And uh, there'll be an, an option uh, becoming an official. Click on that, and uh, all the Dragonfly information will be there on how to sign up, how to uh, you know get the app, and so on and so forth. So once again, Dragonfly is the app that manages everything about officiating, from education to re-education, a contact hours, assigning assigners, permitting, you, uh, permitting the, the whole work, licensure, permitting, whatever you want to call it. Uh, from from A to Z. Uh, so the, again, that's um, uh, dragonflyathletics.com. And but that'll be uh, the the uh, the web address will be on the OHSA website. I love it, Toby. Hey, thank you for the time. Stick My pleasure. Thank you for here. having me. I appreciate you. Stick around a little bit here. I'm going to. Uh... <clears throat> Talk to you a little bit off camera. Toby Dunlap, sure. thanks for the time. My pleasure. Thank you.